All right, everybody, welcome to Straight to the Point, completely off topic. I'm your host, Kyle Dunbar, and today we have a very special guest with us, the voice of the tattooing world and my dear friend, Carl Blasphemy. How are you doing, Carl? Dude, I'm doing amazing. How are you? Um, I'm feeling pretty fantastic because I feel like that was the most professional intro I've done yet. So, so far, we're off to a great start. Sounded great, man. I thought, wow, what the hell doing? <laughs> <laughs> I'm getting I'm getting yelled at by my wife for not taking this seriously enough. <laughs> Every day she's uh, she, I, I guess it's getting popular and I appreciate everybody listening. But um, it's it's also uh, it's weird for it to be popular because then I I begin to feel like I have something I need to live up to. And that's not you know, I don't like expectations. You're spreading almost as fast as COVID. Yeah, boy, I, I wish. Jeez. Wouldn't that be nice? Well, hopefully I won't. I might I might die out as quick or at least become it as adverse as people <laughs> have become. They'll be like they'll, they'll be like non mask wearers will be like the non listeners or something as well. Or just but get back on topic. <laughs> good call. <laughs> yeah, I feel like I'm so done with COVID now. It's amazing that we as an industry, our industry, your industry almost is. Well, it's ours, isn't it? Uh, but yeah. we tattoo and travel. We do tattoo conventions. Carl is the MC of the most successful tattoo conventions I've ever been to and the best MC. There's a few exceptions yeah. to this yeah. rule of people who 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 do okay. Chris Steele. <laughs> I, yeah, I love you, Chris Steele. Um uh uh Tyler Fire saved my ass and um where was it? Mm -hmm. Cincinnati. Um I, I, I went and I came home for a day. Like I get to fly home for a freaking day and I leave, I go to Cincinnati and my wife calls me and says, uh, Riley's got COVID. I'm like, God damn it. <laughs> <laughs> God damn it. I get this call Friday morning. Um, and right. I already been hanging I'm... out Thursday night. So, oh, I, uh, okay. Right. Yeah, you had to, yeah. you had to quarantine while you were at the show then. Yeah, so Friday, uh, I told her, I'm like, look, dude, I was only home for a day. Riley's got COVID. She just tested positive. He's like, well, you need to go test. Go test now. Boom, I tested. I was negative. And he's like, you know, abundance of caution, dude. Just you're off for the weekend. Um, right. And I'm like, well, Chris can cover. I got my playlist. So he used my playlist and he filled in for my announcements. Did a great job. He saved my ass on that one. I still got paid. Thanks, Troy. I appreciate that. Troy's great like that. And, Troy uh, is the uh, owner of Villain Arts. I'm going to tell yeah, everybody. Yeah. Uh, Villain Arts is, is the tattoo convention circuit that I travel on the most. And one of the most, one of the reasons I travel on it the most, two reasons, I guess, really. Number one is they have the most shows and the best shows. They know how to do it. Number two is you're there. Yeah, they've, uh, Troy's really kind of set the standard, dude, on what, what a tattoo uh, convention or festival should be like. And you know, and now he's changed from conventions to festivals. It's. it's I was just going to say. Forward. Yeah. Hey, you remember now, Anthrax way back in the day? Spreading the disease. Spreading the disease. Yes, the group oh, Anthrax, yeah. not not the drug, but uh, yeah. or not the uh, the poison, but uh, the yes, Anthrax had that um, in their uh, or did? Oh my God, I was just brain farted so bad. <laughs> <laughs> all i can think a little not man run around on stage and, but oh yes a festival that was what it was now that we're changing the name to a festival all i can think of is is that one song that they had that was like a rap a freaking festival that's um that the only that one i probably, can remember in the early days if you had like was rap was on the man remember that yeah wasn't it in that wasn't it in that know. Where they covered up one of their swear words with um, oh, yeah. a festival. Yeah, yeah. For the radio edit, they covered up the uh, F word. That's what it yes. was. Yes. And it, <laughs> okay. I'm sorry. Wow, it's extremely dude. obscure. He totally, totally pulled that from far left field. <laughs> it's all I can think of every time I look at the festival change now, because I'm used to calling them, of course, Villain Arts Tattoo Conventions. But, but honestly, uh, doesn't it feel more like a festival now? I mean, with all the added entertainment and all the other crazy uh, stuff that's going on in the room. I mean, yeah, more than just a convention. Because remember back in the day, you'd show up. It was like, oh, quiet. And we'd have seminars, which, you know, we still have our seminars. But it was more of a, a business feel and, and serious collectors coming in. 
But yeah. now our, our younger demographic that comes in and, and the older demographic as well get to enjoy like sideshow, Ringling Brothers performers, magic magicians, contortionists, suspension, weird yep. ass aerial stuff. It's it's great. Suspensions. Yeah. Tell me about suspensions, because I don't I mean, that just sounds like so what? But to me, they're very I mean, just that people do them. It is amazing. Yeah, I mean, uh, there's there's gigantic needles or hooks, uh, you know, or bars going through various parts of her skin and they're hanging from the ceiling, you know, 25, 50 feet in the air and swinging around from their back or hooks through their knees. It's it's crazy to watch. We had Sylvester Stallone come to one of our conventions and he wanted to start punching them like meat racks. We were like, no, bro. (laughs) No, no. These are performers. thinking he was Sylvester Stallone. (laughs) All right on. Did he did when when Jeff Goldblum showed up? Did he get to see any suspension? Um, he didn't see the suspension, but I was in the uh, back hallway with him and um talking with Steve Truitt, and Steve was showing him his split tongue. So I was like, "Yo, Jeff, he's got a split tongue." We were talking body mods, and yeah, uh, he was like, "Oh, I still got the video." And I'm like, "That's nothing, dude. He's got a split penis." <laughs> and then Jeff lost it. I'm like, "You want to see?" And of course, he didn't want to see Steve. He didn't. Like, no, he didn't want to see. And Steve was kind does of like Steve cool really have a split penis. Steve Truitt, yes, he does. Yeah, yeah. Oh, I didn't know. Several of our friends do. You didn't what know? The f- no, like what? How? What do you do with it? What do you do with a split penis? No, all I can think really about is a hot dog when I put it in the microwave too long. <laughs> yeah, I'm not really authorized to talk about all that because I'm not well schooled on a split penis i mean okay God. well i just like I'm, i've never seen split penis porn i'm gonna go check that out now because i want to like i would probably watch a video of a guy peeing with a split penis because i'm curious how does that work you know like, what? talk to old neller old he'll, neller he'll, yeah he'll he'll tighten you up <laughs> he'll tell you, all of it sounds scary too like like yeah. uh I want to know somebody pretty well before I start asking them about their split penis. Like, yeah, like, can yeah. you pee in the wind? Are there two streams? Oh, Is that because you got, got two girlfriends? I got a picture. I got a video of old Nella where, where um, I believe this was, uh, this may have been Cincinnati as well. We were drunk coming over the bridge and Neil peed off the bridge onto a uh, train and it was two different streams coming out. I'm like, Neil's peeing in two streams. It was great. But you don't, you don't mean pickles. Yes. Pickles. Pickles got his dick split. Oh, has has forever, dude. He's big in the body mods. That's what he right on he did before he came with us on Villain Arts. I guess I didn't know the other nickname you were giving him. What were you calling Dr. Keller? No, old Neller. Like you know, old, old Neller. Neller. Yeah. yeah. That's old Neil. Neller, right? Uh, and for people who don't know, Neil <laughs> is one of the cogs, the very, very important cogs of the yeah. villain arts machinery. Neil, uh, not a tattoo artist, but this these shows don't go on without the guy. And uh, and oftentimes he gets drunk and is our entertainment in story for the weekend. Oh, yeah. He uh, actually he left Atlanta and has made it to Chicago now, has unloaded a truck and is laying down electricity for the Chicago show this weekend. Right. On. So before we even I'm getting ready to pack, we're going to it's funny. Kenny was just saying I wanted to do some work on the living room. And she's like, "Nah, I think you're going to help me uh, do the laundry in the suitcase because we're going to open that up today. <laughs> so we have a stinky suitcase full of laundry. I don't know. Kenny, is that a good idea? We leave our stinky clothes in the suitcase until and now the suitcase is going to stink. We're putting like, clean clothes back in the stinky. Suit. We're going to have to we're going to sanitize that. That's what we're going to do. Right. <laughs> um, but they're already there setting everything up. They do the street team. Are they still doing street team type stuff or is it all become, uh, digitized now? Oh, no, it's both. It's still a, a street team. It's still a group of people who run into local bars and stores and shops, which and put flyers is honestly them. huge. It, yeah. it, to me, it's yeah. always been huge, but I, I don't know. And maybe I'm going to give out too much secret, but I'm not scared of it so much because two things, one candy can edit. She's awesome. I'll add it. <laughs> Not really. She hates listening to everything having to go over. So I'm sorry. You might have to do it. But number one reason I like the street t- or I'm not scared to talk about the street team is no one can do it right. Like if you try, you need a street team to put on a tattoo convention, in my opinion, because they have to be out there meeting people and stuff. But when they do it wrong, they're just out there like, here's some paperwork. 
here's some flyers. Can I put this up? I don't even care. Fuck you. You know, or when you hire a group or just a, a team just that does it and you send out a bunch of kids and they don't know anything yeah. about that going or, you know, they're not in the industry or they just throw them in the trash. I yeah, mean, they I need to be somebody that's actually interested in seeing a success that knows how to talk to people, knows to be personable. Right. When I was doing um, Easy Riders and um, doing the Easy Rider Rodeo stuff, they sent me out um, in Ohio to the Chillicothe show to be the street team. Um, and I, I did it by myself. I went to over 100 shops um, and Harley Davidson dealerships. And each one went in, took a picture with uh, whoever I was with. And they, the first day John Green called me, he was like, dude, you hit it out of the park, man. People are calling me. This is great that you're the You one didn't do 100 in one day, did you? <clears throat> no, 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 no. No, that was like okay. a, that was a four day thing, man. That I was going to say, so man. Yeah. I went all throughout Ohio, just every Harley dealership or shop or bike builder or place like that. And a lot of places knew me when I came in from the Easy Riders, but, um, they were stoked because it wasn't some college kid or, you know, somebody that didn't have anything to do with the show, just coming in and, and giving stuff away. Right. Yeah. As somebody that was actually working it understood right. why it's even existing, which is kind of a question I have to ask you because I, I kind of, I only vaguely understand why I even go <laughs> except, except my paycheck, I guess, keeps me coming back. Like I have to now at this point, I have nobody wants to get tattooed in my own hometown. However, which is not true, Candy tells me. But um, I only vaguely know why I go to shows. Like, and I'm always amazed by one how much fun everybody is having, and and how <laughs> like people are coming through the door, they're having fun. It's one of the most boring things in the world to sit and watch someone else get tattooed. But yes, it is. Absolutely. Somehow we have entertained. We've turned it into a festival. Exactly. Um, and, and and people are having fun like it for me suspension is awesome i don't mind seeing that a bit because it it weirds me out every time it's kind of like a feeling that i get when i when i watch uh like a ufc or an mma fight like you one you're watching it for entertainment value but also for me i'm always thinking what the fuck is possessing this guy to go out <laughs> and do if you're wondering what Kyle's talking about, um, hit my social media, Instagram. It's, uh, at D R blasphemy, B L A S P H E M Y doctor blasphemy. Same thing with TikTok. They keep, I'm banned from TikTok right now for another few days um, uh, <laughs> or hit John Tuzon's or just go to YouTube and just type in suspension villain arts. And you'll see some of the suspension videos and what we're talking about right now. Yeah. People are um, hanging from hooks from their back, from their chest, from their knees, and they they elbows hoist hoist them elbows. I mean, anywhere you guys, we saw a guy hang from his face once. Remember that? Yeah, yeah, I remember. He only got like an inch off the ground, you know, because they're being. But it's his face. Like, what do you want? They weren't going to pull him up into the the rafters. They do sometimes. There was a girl and a guy both that did suspension from their face and. it was their wow. face and I think uh, their chest at the same time. And they swung around okay. the room. I was just like, oh, okay. my God. See, if you had yeah. it on your chest, too, I guess the, the kid, only kid I said, uh, he did it with just his face, which is just. Ugh. Yeah. yeah. All the way around, it's insane. <laughs> I always imagined that I might do it because I once watched in school a man called Horse. If you're familiar with that movie, a boy, a uh, uh, of white guys raised up inside of an, um, a native Indian, uh, Native American, uh, uh, not reservation, what do you call it? It was just free roam. It was in America. It was back when it was theirs. Let's say that. And, uh, and they took this guy in <laughs> and he became part of the tribe. And to become part of the tribe, though, he had to go through a ritual and he hung from his chest and the actual actor actually hung from his chest in the movie. And I was... I was really taken back by it. Like that was pretty amazing. You put yourself in that. You're like, it's got to hurt. It's got to put you through all these things. The guy had a spiritual catharsis while he was up there. And then I watch all these tattooed punks doing it now. And it makes yeah. it seem commonplace. Cause I'm like, well, that guy went up by his chest. I guess it hurts. That girl's hanging by her knee. Dude, when I was doing the ink life score, um, who was doing it? It was uh, Spartacus Durant was the yes. guy doing suspension stuff. And there was a girl that every time she went in the air, 
and she would do it from her back, the two in the, the back there, right, the shoulder blades, mm-hmm. she would have an orgasm. And you would, you know, and when he, then when he hugged me, because the first time she did it, she came down, she was like, oh my God, and her legs were quivering. And I thought she was passing out. Mm-mm. Right. No, uh-uh. she was having the big O. What? And, what? Uh, what? and then the next time, <laughs> and then they told me about it afterwards. And I'm like, this is amazing. So the next time she went up, I, I, I watched her closely and yeah, she was doing it again. And, uh, about what do you do as an MC time. in that situation? Do you what keep? Do you, do? Do you, you hold your K seven? Come, baby, come, and let her suspend. <laughs> <laughs> That's exactly what I did. Come, oh. come, baby, one, two, come, baby, come. <laughs> you know, and, yes. and we all got it because it was an inside joke. It's not something I announced to the crowd. Okay, I don't want to embarrass the person at all. Right, but it was an inside joke to us. You know. And yeah. um, I would make little inside jokes, but nobody called on to what we were talking about. And I'll never tell who the girl was. It was just, you know, that's a private thing. But right. I mean, you, go, you think it's very painful, but it could be very pleasurable, too. As she proved. Yeah, but she's got to be twisted up in the head. I'm like, oh my, no, <laughs> no, not necessarily. <laughs> like she needs she's like her and her old man are getting it on. And it's like, hit me with the brick again. Oh, no, no, no. I'm just glad she wasn't a squirter. That would have been horrible. <laughs> <laughs> I guess I guess that was my next question. Oh. system going off. Is there a fire? Oh, my God. That would have been horrible. <laughs> I didn't smell yeah, smoke. You know, that is not the only thing we're doing at the shows. Um, and we do that after 9, usually right about 9.30, because most of the kids are out of the room at that point in the day. Right. Um, throughout the day. There's, most uh, of the kids uh, with good parents. Yeah. yeah. Well, <laughs> then I there's mean, parents like, like myself that are like, nah, good luck, kid. It's a fucking freaky world. You might yeah, as well get to yeah. know that soon enough. <laughs> well, you know, David's been uh, your, your boy. has been at the show since he's been a baby. So he came yep. up watching these shows and he used to sit there to the point he knew everybody's line, you know, for every yeah. show. Oh, yeah, and, because uh, now now I should say the other show, there, we have plenty of shows. It isn't just suspension. But David used to sit through all I mean, suspensions, too, but also through the um, Tyler Fire and Thrill Kill Jill's uh, car- carnival show. What? Yeah, what, they're, they're not side shows, though. really, are they? That's a lucky their level thrill show. Yeah, it's more the old carny sideshow type stuff that okay. they do. Um, and, and then, then the Enigma. Yep. The, with the his old, his show mm-hmm. where he would he would swallow um, Gatorade and then siphon it back out of his stomach through a tube that he had put through several other orifices of his body and then recycle it and drink it again. Yeah, that was always cool. <laughs> and then, um, yeah. old it's cool show. the first time you watch it you're a little disgusted the second time you watch it you learn just to watch everybody else's faces oh that's great it's like when that two girls one cup video was up and they had all the reaction videos to the video itself i would, ne- I would stand at the side of the stage and just watch the crowd when he would swallow that again it was it was amazing yeah. and uh old oh. city side show they were reggie and danny they were amazing um and they would oh. have people staple money to them you know, now yeah. we went with uh, more of a uh, not saying they weren't G-rated because well they weren't, but now um James Maltman, he's the Ringling Brothers. You've seen him, the juggling yeah. and uh, the clowning and the way he interacts and involves children in the show. Um, and one thing about Ringling is it is the most exclusive school in the world. Yeah, and he's like uh, you cannot he's get into it. Yeah, he's unless they his invite. Own, he's got his own nonprofit down there. Um. For like clowning in Atlanta, where he lives, he started up the. Um, I wish I knew the name exactly, but check out jamesmaltmanarts.com um, or check him out on our social media, and you'll be able to link up and find out what that is. It's very cool. He teaches kids how to do all the stuff that he's doing. Or oh wow! Do but um, and he's got a couple other professional clowns and jugglers that work with him to work with children in the area. So it's it's great. He gives back like that, you know. And uh, Captain and Maybell turned me on to him. They're another okay. side show that we They're kind of who we're, we're running with the most right now. You were going to say kind of more G-rated? Yeah, I mean, Is they, that, can go, okay. they can be adult. They can definitely be adult and go R-rated if they want. And and it's kind of like Danny Borneo used to say, if um, your kids get the jokes, bad parenting. <laughs> You're <laughs> you <know>? a bad <laughs> parent. <laughs> parent. <laughs> Depending on how you look at it. You know, right. But, um, right. Yeah, they, they go G, you know, or PG, um, and it's traditional sideshow. They hold a Goodest book world records. They've been in eight different Ripley's, believe it or not, books. 
They're so movies. They're a great fun hour on a stage. Of uh, they've they've been um, on trading spouses. Is that right? Or was it wife swap as well? Wife swap. Wife swap. And, and she's uh, Mabel was telling me that she's been, they've been in several movies yeah. now and, and they're having easier times getting cast because once you're once you're kind of in that line, you got it on your resume and these movie people, they're not trying to work so hard anyway, so they can find the first one, you know, and 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 they're always good for it um, yeah. because they, they do such a wide breadth. Like with um, Ink Master Pavani and um, God, what was the other lady's name? Pavani and God, forget the other lady's name. They used to call me all the time. Dude, so who do you know in this state? Or who do you know here? Who do you know here? Oh, you yes, because you, where... you, for some extent, you did a large amount of the logistical work or, or the finding work, the, the searching yeah, work. Yeah. Yeah. For the casting of Ink Masters. Yeah, exactly. And it was it was fun. I mean, you know, I got to. Let me ask you this before I get into that. I want to talk to you a lot about Ink Masters. Obviously, that's the only reason people listen to. But um, I want to ask you first, how long have you been doing uh, the tattoo um, conventions, tattoo festivals? Uh, This starts my 21st year, I believe. I just did my uh, 20th year in Detroit. So as somebody who's been doing this 20 years, you're obviously the people casting for Ink Master. They start running out of being able how to find people. You watched the first episode. They had like eight tattoo artists on it. Right. Second, they had 16. Well, pretty soon they need some help finding people. And who is the best person to turn to to help find people in states and places and looks and, and uh, demographics? But yourself, because you've been doing this for 20 years yeah, and I kind of know TV because I, I got the TV and radio background from the broadcasting school days. So you've got a very, I don't know, you, your background is very, I don't know if I call it eclectic, but you started out as a private investigator. Isn't that one of the, I mean, the first kind of adult professional jobs that you had? Well, I started out DJing like when I was okay. four, 13, 14 with um, a guy named DJ Ray and Crazy Kenny. They, they taught me how to do stuff. I would carry their equipment. More radio. No, just at like private party stuff. Okay. And, um, and, uh, and then I um, dropped out of school when I was like 16. DJ. Yes. And, Way to go. Scout concert <laughs> tickets and, and play Dungeons and Dragons. Uh, and was it, I, and um, this was in Baltimore, right? Yeah. Yeah. And then I apprenticed at uh, Tattoo Charlie's when I was um, 17, turning 18. Uh, I forgot that you used to tattoo as well. Yeah. And then uh, my uh, girlfriend got pregnant. So we got married. You know, (laughs) I quit doing (laughs) that and went working. And then uh, my buddy Paul got a job uh, with a private detective agency uh, doing a lot of undercover work. So So that's um, what you started. Yeah, that's what started. They were like, dude, we need somebody else like you. He goes, I got a guy. (laughs) But then (laughs) you ended up doing radio again. Am I wrong? Yeah, no, I got hurt at work. Um, and uh, it blew out my shoulder completely. I had to replace my shoulder. And they were like, you can't do this work anymore. I'm like, well, I got to go to broadcasting school. Because they were like, we got to retrain you. So they paid for me to go to broadcasting school. Then I, um, a month out of broadcasting school, went to work at 98 Rock. 98 Rock, uh, I've been there with you generally. And I think we yeah. get invited there when we go to Baltimore more because of you. It's be, it's, um, one of the biggest radio stations, rock radio stations in Baltimore, correct? Yeah, it's one of the tops in the market. Um, Baltimore, D.C., Virginia, Pennsylvania. I mean, it goes all over. Every time I would crack open a mic, over a million people would hear my voice, which was kind of cool. You know, that is cool. I was, it's it's, kind, of cool. And, kind of intimidating, too, because when you screw up, over a million people hear you <laughs> heard it. <laughs> Yeah, there's no editing there, man. I, we, actually, that's the way me and Candy started. And now she's able to cut out a few of my us. So she makes me sound more intelligent. Thank God it was yeah, needed. I wouldn't, I wouldn't work in a delay. I would just go straight. You know, the morning show would have to do a delay because you never know what some of the people are going to say. But okay, um, yeah. as regular jocks, we would drop out of delay and just go straight on hot mic. And then a delay is so that if somebody swears, like I often make the mistake to do, you got like seven right. seconds that they can say, oh, nope. And they edit that whole almost yeah. 30 seconds sometimes, well, right? What it does is it cuts it. Yeah, the, the seven, it's a typical seven second delay. So when you hit the button, it just drops it out. 
and it starts over and it ramps up. So that's when they start talking, you'll hear them drag a word like that. That's the delay. Oh. Okay. Yeah. If, they're, if, if the word gets word. really long, seven yeah. seconds long almost. No, then... not, not quite that long, but it'll be a few words like that that'll drag out so the delay can build up. And it'll build okay. Up. Right yeah. on to and seven then, seconds. When you said that about the uh, editing in the Oz, when um, uh, Halo, uh, love Halo. Yeah. Um, dude, when, um, I, I, when I first met him, I kind of like took him under my wing and, um, got him to do his, you know, first, uh, real road shows out of Maryland and his first seminar and, and I don't have him do TV interviews with me or interviews. And he would be, uh, um, uh, um, <laughs> and they're clutch words. Everybody does it. I mean, if you listen to people talk that don't talk in the way yes. of an interviewer, not trained to, it'll be, um, uh. They're clutch words or, or beds for us over top of underneath of what we're trying to say. And I would stand there at his interview and I would count them off on my finger. I did that to him like twice. And he was so aware of it that by his like third interview after that, he was no longer saying, ah, and, mm. is that a so, technique you learned yourself through broadcasting school or you just kind of oh, knew? Yeah. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. They would count them off for you visibly. And you would, you would be like, Oh, once you're conscious of it, you have the ability to change better. Right. Well, no, they wouldn't count them off to be like, dude, what the hell? You know, it's <laughs> okay. like, you know, but I, I physically stood in front of him behind the camera where he's supposed to be looking, you know, and right. I would count my hand two, three, five, nine, you know, and, uh, you know, there it went for me. And uh, it just uh, <laughs> dropped, out of his, it dropped out of his parent, his pattern. You know, it was, it now, that was when Halo was just starting out for the most part. Um, or certainly we didn't know him from ink masters then this was very early on i think you knew halo before i did and i met him seven shit i met him 15 years ago yeah at at at, uh, chicago i met him at the baltimore show um and he um and he uh (laughs) he was just a great artist and we got along very well i um by the end of the weekend uh, i introduced him to marshall bennett I took Marshall over with me. And Marshall those, Bennett. Of you don't, those of you that don't know Marshall Bennett, look him up. Dude's amazing out of Michigan. Uh, he was one of the kings of black and gray portraits. And in the day, there was nobody better. You know, him and Bob yes. Terrell, were, was, they, they were the shit. So, yeah, they were drinking buddies and, yeah. and, uh, and, and following the same styles and ability. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that was like a whole crew out there too, man. Tom Renshaw was with them on that. But well, anyway, with the ability, I don't think he was really drinking too often. Am I wrong? Did you? No, 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 he still was. Marshall's oh, was he? Yeah, oh, no, I mean, yeah. Tom. Tom seems oh, pretty Tom, straight-laced, Tom. too. No, Tom's, I used to call him the Chuck Norris of tattooing. Because back in the day, he, he looked like Chuck like, Norris. Yeah, yeah a really bigger, just, yeah. Not, not taller, <laughs> but bigger bu- muscle. Um, speaking of influential, though, let me stop you for a second, because we're talking about a laundry list of extremely influential people in my career. And also, um, I'm seeing some kind of similarity similarities, even as you because you met Halo before you met me. Um, it, let me thank you first off, I, I guess, as I as I begin this, because one of the most influential people I've ever met was you. In tattooing, my career never really started until we met. You know, I, I mean, I was kind of hanger on. I met Halo from across the way, but I had already known you. And it's like you were this like a liaison or just like he was for the casting agents of Ink Masters. He does the same for you. If you see Carl at a show, buy him a beer, get him a Red Bull. Be nice to the guy. Trust me. <laughs> also, if you see Carl at the show, recognize that he has started extremely successful careers or been the um it's not like it's not like i've met carl now i'm somebody but i meet carl we're friends we're hanging out we're at the bar and now i meet marshall bennett now i meet bob tyrell now i meet well i'd already met tom tom's never at the bar he's actually kind of boring like that now <laughs> but I'm Candy dunbar well i'd already known her too thankfully yeah, um, yeah, but I mean, everybody else, that's a kick in the ass to me, Candy Dunbar. I mean, let's not forget about your wife. That no, you're right. Amazing. Yes. She's a great artist. She keeps your shit straight. And yes. we would just, when you guys are not at a villain art show and she's not judging for us, we suffer. It's just <laughs> oh, yes. 
I'm we glad were to hear it. This weekend, dude. It took me over two hours to do contests this weekend. Why? Because Candy and Candace weren't there. Oh man, Candace um, I had Reed. One more table, yeah. Candace Reed and Candy, the Candy Crush, as Troy calls it. You know. Okay. If we'd have had those two ladies with us, we'd have had the contest done in time. But no, we had to run over. Wow. We're so man, we've got so many shows back to back. And and that one we couldn't get the health department together in time. I don't know if they're you know how sometimes it's like health department's always funny. Sometimes you gotta email them and you do everything they ask you to in their thing, but then you also have to check to make sure that they are doing their job of receiving the email. It's so annoying. But so you you continually need to pester them sometimes. Um and that just kind of happened with Georgia for us. And then now we got this, we're doing Chicago and I think Cincinnati, right? Yeah, and, Cleveland's after Chicago. Okay, C- Cleveland. I I feel yeah, like a, sometimes a like a, a touring band when they get up on stage and they're like, hey, everybody, it's great to be in Springfield. And they're like, Dude, I've, fucking totally not Springfield. This, I've totally had this Spinal Tap moment. There are times where <laughs> when I'm talking, I have to stop and think, where am I? <laughs> you especially, especially like you do more of these year. than me yeah i'm in like four or five different states every week you know i'll leave yes. baltimore fly into chicago hang out there for a few hours to go out to you know minneapolis for the weekend you know i, I do even when i hear it i wonder why do we do it it sounds i think to the person that might be listening at home just flying because they don't fly that often sounds awesome you know, like, oh, yeah, but you don't just land in Tahiti every time you no, you land yeah. in in in. I I always say I, I love Baltimore because of Halo and you. But Baltimore is one of the scariest cities for me to go to. Sometimes you land in Baltimore. See, I was going to go with Newark, New Jersey. Sometimes you land in Newark. In Newark. <laughs> I, yes. Dude, you got I've a point there, too. The airport. There are pigeons flying through the airport. It's yes. Filthy. yes. What, what is it? Don't. What is the name of that airport? Is it just Newark? Yeah, the Newark airport. Um, okay, because I know they're like, we can fly into the JFK or we can go to Newark. And you're like, oh, man. <laughs> and I don't really care for JFK either, man. Uh, Chicago. No, Midway. too much international flights. Yeah, that's another dirty one. If you go to Midway in Chicago and like Baltimore, that's where they wrote the song Bad, Bad Leroy Brown. You know, that's what they wrote about the south side of Chicago. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I landed a song there, that- I landed in Minneapolis once by mistake, you know, or no, going to Chicago by mistake. I was going, uh, I meant to go to O'Hare, but I booked Southwest before they went to O'Hare and they only went to Midway and I landed at the wrong damn airport. How That's- far away was it? Oh, like maybe 70 miles or something like that. A uh, long cab ride. Expensive no, cab no, ride. I actually posted up on my social media. So uh, I landed at the wrong airport. Somebody give me a ride. <laughs> And uh, damn wow. it, one of the Easy Rider guys gave me a ride. A biker from one of the rodeos came, picked me up in his truck, took me. Is it crazy the numbers of, I mean, it's a network of people. I, I broke down in Iowa in my RV um, when I was living in it three, four years ago now. Uh, and, and immediately had two to three people, you know, like I'm in Iowa. I don't know. No, well, I guess I do know people in Iowa. You know, and, and they, they start coming out the woodworks to help me. Um, I was it, it's so it, it's so amazing to me that. That we can like, like I, I feel sometimes unknown in my own city that you get outside of the city of, of the state. And it's almost like you have more opportunity because you have so many friends all over the place. You know? Yeah, it's like a great big family, man. And everybody wants to help each other. You know, right. I, I think I part of the. I think some of the trick is we don't see each other long enough to get angry enough to not get, you know what I mean? Like they're like, yeah, it's been a while since I've seen Kyle. I'll go help him in his RV. But if you were talking about the, uh, like the moods and the tattoo conventions and, and, you know, having a good time and stuff like that and people watching, uh, it's, it's, you know, a great time. We all come together and we're so happy to see each other. You know, it's, it's kind of um, contagious. Can't help but be happy and want to be a part of that. (laughs) That's I, that's what I feel. I always wonder why the, the clients come in sometimes. I know there's the shows, but and I ask them and they're always having fun. They always have something to talk about. I'm like, what you guys been doing this weekend? And they'll go off 15, 20 minutes at least talking yeah. about shit they've done. Right. No problem starting conversation like that. I'm just always kind of amazed because I know why I show up. 
because like I don't feel normal anywhere else. I went to my first tattoo convention and I was I was blown away at how many freaks there were. And I was like, Kyle, you're like you're like right in the middle of normal. Like every other day you might feel like you're just a walking around freak out here. You're you're mid you're median freak. You're middle of the class freak. Yeah, I mean, it's uh, it's not even about freak. I mean, well, Al, Alakazam's got his freak clothing line, so we will keep fucking free. But, <laughs> yes, um, Alakazam, about, the yeah. contortionist uh, and street performer extraordinaire, oftentimes at the shows, keeping people entertained, too. He'll be in Chicago with us this weekend, as a matter of fact. Oh, awesome. I love, yeah, I love uh, it's funny for me, I, I'll be listening to the stage shows going on. I will know almost every line like my son does, but he's seen them. So he's watching them. He knows every line. I'll know every line and have no idea what they're doing on stage. Eventually I'll get a cancellation or some kind of free time. I didn't get to see uh, his show maybe, but once, and I had already heard it like 10 times. So I finally got to put the reference to the jokes that he was doing in the audience, you know, um, which man does he do a great job pulling people in and and interacting with the crowd a lot like the uh, the clown himself, um, James Maltman. Maltman. Yeah, James Maltman. Yeah, very yeah. good again at, at uh, yeah. interacting with the crowd. Al's won awards for uh, street performances and street performing. He performs all over the world. You know, just on the street, dude is great and makes a living out of it. You know, yeah. So it tells you how good he is. What? Um, <laughs> I'm already laughing. What what other job could be as awesome that you could just like, man, I need to make some money for some Burger King. And you go off to a local corner somewhere in Boston. I think that's where he's at now. And yeah. you just start performing and you put enough money in your pocket for the day for food and all that. Of course, the other way, other job I was thinking of, of street performers, street walker. But, um, well, you know, <laughs> kind of the same English. thing. Well, kind of. It's just Al's on his feet. They're on their back. Yeah, and a little cleaner. Al's a you little know, bit cleaner after the day's done. It's not like it's not even Burger King money. It's like you know, I need to pay the mortgage, pay the car payment, and cable bill. Right. And let's go out and do a shows this weekend, and boom, you know. <laughs> yeah, it seems like it would really open. I mean, the it's like uh, you're a farmer, and well, I don't even know. It's not. I don't even know what it's like. You just could walk out the door and start making money, like you have a money tree. I just like, I'll just walk out on the sidewalk and start being entertaining. How about that? Could you imagine if he became an evangelist? Oh my God. That altar call would be hilarious. Oh, he'd be all over. I'm sorry. I'm getting notifications. I'm they're doing the oh. uh, social media for villain arts magazine now and helping that's, out with that. That's so, uh, something I really wanted to get to is that as influential as you are, um, part of that influence, it comes from y- your, your, having or using influence is that right i mean like for me uh i came to a show and it it maybe i hope this works for other people i hope this makes sense for other people like if you're going to shows as a tattoo artist and anybody helps you out help them out right um sometimes you could do it with money sometimes you're just going to help them carry their bags you're going to give them plastic uh wrap paper towel you know it's just being nice but when you helped me out one time, I was a young guy. I had nobody knew me, I came to a show and immediately you, a girl came up to you looking for some work to do. You looked out, you couldn't find anybody that you knew already that wasn't um, already busy. And then there I was. So we had talked and you knew that I did good work. You came up, introduced us. I ended up working on that girl for three days that weekend and won two or three awards off of yeah off of the work we did i mean both lower legs it was done yeah, she had like stars or some shit didn't she yeah some, some, some kind of weird abstract stars the judges yeah. liked it i'm sure i'd hate it nowadays if i saw it that was uh um, Kentucky. it was lexington yeah. or louisville kentucky one of the two it was a uh, castle of color i believe I, I, it seems right it seems um like it was possibly our second year doing it though cause, or, or yeah. maybe the second year we came back i remember the one year we came in it doesn't seem like it was the same year that all the penises were in the most unusual te- c- category. No. You remember that? that weird. 
that was weird. It was like most unusual category is always up there. People put in the most unusual tattoos. Sometimes they're done good. Sometimes they're done bad, but they're always unusual. And in this case, it was like 14 guys lined up and had to pull their cocks out so they could show you their tattoos. <laughs> like, yeah, it was it was hard to judge. <laughs> hopefully they were soft when you're judging them <laughs> i didn't even dude i wasn't judging i was too busy talking to the crowd i i think uh if i'm not mistaken <laughs> judy parker was up there judging okay and and it was she's she's like an older tattooer from uh she's out in california she's another great female artist and tattooer yes. her flash her flash was the shit in the days man it was it was oh, amazing yeah. um but i think it was her she was up there yeah, maybe they had Lyle Tuttle up there too. I don't know, but Lyle had his, his penis tattooed as well. So was he showing him his or? No, 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 no. Lyle didn't show him the guys. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he's not into that. He might have come to San Francisco, but that wasn't his bag. Yeah, yeah. Lyle would miss be, Lyle. Hey, remember, remember when he pulled Joe Peters and everyone was like, "Joe, you see my Red Sox picks?" <laughs> pulls him over and pulls up some. And Joe Joe Peterson. Um, is is a big fucking Boston Red Sox fan. So he's thinking he's getting some good Red Sox picks from Lyle. Oh, okay. It was, it was pictures <laughs> of Lyle's socks up in the air, and I'll let you just think about the rest. <laughs> right. Do we do we not say I'm gonna say it? Because I mean Lyle ain't bothered by it, is he? Nobody's living on to take his um he's like, oh my gosh, I think differently of him now. Lyle was a rock and roll party motherfucker until the day he died. And Whoa. So if I'm not mistaken, generally in the photo of his red socks would be a pair of his red socks, one on his foot, at least um, his penis somewhere in the mix and usually a girl's head as well. Is somewhere that, in the mix. <laughs> that, all three of those things would somehow be in the video just so he could show you his red socks picks. Yeah. Oh, they were great. man. I, I Which you've done them. the same thing to us with your, uh, hey, Kyle, did I show you my picture of my new shoes? <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. The new shoes one. That's I not actually want my penis. But, um. I'm hoping. I'm hoping not. I feel bad for your girlfriend. That thing is like my girlfriend. That thing is like got an elbow. <laughs> yes, you asked your wife. Yeah, I should feel bad for. I forgot you guys got married. I should know yeah. these. Things. Um, I guess I didn't really forget so much as I gave the wrong <laughs> name. But when somebody helps you out like that, help them out and. I don't, I, maybe I'm pandering, maybe Candy will edit this out, but that weekend I was so happy to tip you out and I hope people understand that that's like, I think that helped me in so many ways because obviously you're going to help me after that, you know, it just makes sense. <laughs> Buy somebody a, a drink when they help you out uh, or, or in this case, I mean, I, I made thousands of dollars that weekend. So I gave you, I think, like somewhere to 10 percent possibly of it. And it wasn't lost. I was going there to make nothing, you know, and right. it, it reciprocated. I feel like that was the one. It, Halo actually told me that. I don't know if he told me I should do that. But prior to that, he had explained that you had brought him work and that, that you would he had tipped you for that work. And I'm like, well, that just makes sense. And yeah, then I no, ended up a week later or so Halo, in another. Mm -hmm. Halo yourself. Um, I mean, you and Candy are, are probably the only ones that uh, just consistently just tip me on a regular basis. Almost every show we do together, you guys are fucking jamming something in my pocket somehow or another. Um, it, if, and, it feels and, good to give back some somewhere. <laughs> you know? I, I appreciate the shit out of that. I mean, it's it's amazing. Um, Freestyle Alex recently did something like that. Um, I woke up one morning to a message from him like, hey, Carl, check your, uh, check your Venmo or your PayPal or whatever. And he had dropped you know, like a cat, a tip in there. And I was like, holy nice. shit. He's like, thanks for everything you do. Halo, um, we were, like I said, I, I kind of taken him under my wing when I first met him because he was so talented and so still wanting to learn. Which he uh, still is. It's disgusting how much he wants to learn. Right. Minneapolis <laughs> for Troy, I had him do a uh, convention, a uh, convention seminar on color theory and application color portraits because he yeah. was rushing in on those. And, um, he did the seminar and then he came and he handed me the envelope that had all the money in it for the seminar for people that signed up. I forget what he was charging, 100 or 150 a person. He gave um, you all of it. He handed me the envelope. And he's like, here, hold on to this. I'm like, what's this? He's like, it's the money from my seminar. I'm like, all right. You know, he's like, I'm like, you know, kind of like, all right, well, where do you want to 
put it what do you want to do he's like, right no, right like you're gonna want it back later obviously right, right, walk right. Out. he's like no dude that's yours you know and i'm like no nah, man i can't take this he's like no dude it's yours i wouldn't be doing seminars right now if it wasn't for you right because i you know he didn't want to do seminars i called him I'm like hey halo uh, it was muddy water uh heather heather stumping and her dad stumping. Mm-hmm. yeah uh, yep no i remember marshall took that seminar as well he, yeah he, i got he, marshall he, to do the seminars out there and then him and bob started doing seminars yeah that was but, an uh, awesome show i remember that i mean i don't know that it was so much money but we had a blast doing that it really it was so it's so great but um i called halo i'm like halo I got you a free booth at the Muddy Water Show in Davenport, Iowa. He's like, no way. How'd you do that, dude? I'm like, it was easy. I told him you're doing a seminar. <laughs> <laughs> Which is like a twofer for an artist, though. You yeah, know, it's so, like, you're going right. to make money, and then you're going to make money. But for the, the promoter, in a way, it, you know, it helped them because here was this guy who was winning all these awards and starting to be in magazines, now giving a seminar. And right. Marshall Bennett was also doing a Black and Gray seminar. That's where... um. That's where Spider got my hand tattooed on his inner thigh. The, uh, yeah. you know, the circle finger thing. Oh, yeah. Well, That's your yeah, hand Marshall that he has down there. Yeah, Marshall Bennett took a picture of my hand doing that and then tattooed okay. it. Okay. The way my veins pop out on my hand and stuff. And uh, right. he's like, great, we'll do that there. But uh, Halo did his first seminar there, and then we went into um, Minneapolis, and then he did Detroit, you know, and, and he did a similar thing in Detroit. And that... To, I mean, Halo was nobody at the time, too. If you're a struggling artist or if you're in, curious as to how this stuff starts, I mean, you start to look at other artists and you're like, how do they do it? Because uh, yeah, it's Halo expensive. Was, I wouldn't say he was a nobody. I mean, nobody's actually a nobody. He was just not well known or circulated or promoted. Right. You know? Well, he it, certainly it was wasn't was. to the level that he is now. Oh, hell no. Hell no. And, and that's, I guess, what I, I kind of... What I see of it and how my career started and now also knowing that, that uh, you had taken Halo under your wing prior to, to helping me in the great ways that you have. And I don't, you probably don't even realize because you're just being a nice guy. You're just doing your job. Yeah, kind of, yeah, you know? like Taking them under my wing might not even be the right words for it. It was more or less just helping the brother out. And, and you know, it's kind of well, that's the way you say. I bet that he would say that you took him under your wing, though. You know what he I mean? I bet he would. Well. He did a post once on social media, the three biggest influence in his career and life. And, and I was, and he started it out with me and went to, from me to the mentor owner of a friend of his that passed away and, and then somebody else. It was, it was humbling, you know, I, I, I feel very similar um, from meeting you. I, and then it was, it was so easy to rub elbows with people that were great. If you like, soon you weren't even worried here's the stupid thing that we do as tattoo artists uh that, that often i think will hold us back uh, so give me a second to preach i apologize but it's going to take a moment probably but we we oftentimes as tattoo artists we imagine that you're only as valuable to us as the amount that we can learn from you oh, and you'll yes, see it lord, all the time lord. what's that oh yes lord please go on preach oh <laughs> and a lot of times you'll see it with apprentices they'll start out with their mentor and then they'll stab their mentor in the back and they'll explain to people. It's just that I was, you know, I had already grown beyond him. You know, I, yeah. I was just couldn't learn anything more. And you're like, fucking listen here, bitch. <laughs> Motherfucker opened the door and set the table for you, showed you how to eat and to use a fork. And you took your time to kick him out of the table. And now you're going to a different table because you're better than that table. Fucking a, you can still eat at other tables. But you can still pay homage to those people or you can still sit. You can still f- ask for food from other tables sitting at the table you're at is, is kind of we, we imagine the value that we can get from people. And that's as good as they are, you know, if that makes sense. And when you, when uh, when I met you, when when I met Marshall, when I met Bob, when we all were drinking at the bar and at one point all the talent disappeared. It had nothing to do with how good you could talent or how good you could tattoo. It it was just about being a cool person and having a good time. Exactly. And when that dissipated, I don't know. I I, I kind of got a new love for tattooing. As before, it was like this monster, this this um, passion, you know, that was good, and it needed to eat, and it felt like uh, it felt like I hated other tattoo artists at the shows. When I first started doing shows. I was always in competition with everybody 
at every table. I would go through and I would look through portfolios and I would judge, you know, th those people. I'd be like, these people suck. They might have been cool ass people. They might have had a bad or not as good portfolio as I was thinking they should have. Right. But it had right. nothing. And, and then after I met them, I realized all that stupid chasing after plastic, shiny plastic with foam marble finishes um, or trophies, if you were being a trophy whore, all that meant so little. It was more about the community of artists and uh, of, of feeling like you fit in to somewhere finally, you know. Yeah, I mean, from that, I just want to say thank you for that, actually. I love you, bro. Thank you. It, it's, Dude, you gave it, that to me. It's cool when they win awards and they can not fight with each other. I mean, we just had a situation in Atlanta where a guy did not place. Uh, he had a, it was a black and gray category, a large black and gray, I believe, or mm -hmm. large black and gray. And it was a guy's whole back piece. And a piece that beat him was a smaller piece. It was perfect, perfect. And came up to the judges, Troy being one of those judges, and was like, why didn't I win? My piece was bigger and, you know, blah, 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 blah. <laughs> This right. and that. You know, he's trying to be nice about it until finally he was like, look, dude, it was a smaller piece than your huge piece this, with no no problems in it at all. It was perfect. It was great versus your larger piece with 20 things wrong in it. It's not about how big your tattoo is. This guy was right. like pussy hurt. He really was pussy hurt. Um, but then again, you look out in the audience, you see Rick Magison standing next to um, Jordy Pla standing next right. to Jimmy Calkins and they're all competing with Cody Gower and they're all competing right. for that to other day. Jimmy takes first place. Jordy takes second. Rick takes third or, you know, Cody takes third or Rick takes first. They don't care. They're hugging each other and congratulating each other. Right. When their names right. are red, you know, they're competing for the trophy because it's bragging rights. You just want a trophy in a, a room full of a thousand artists, you know? Right. It's, but honestly, you get so little more out of that if you try to hoard it. Like, yeah. like you get nothing out of the trophy if you just walk away like I've got a trophy. Fuck you all. Now my mom loves me. No, she doesn't. She still thinks you're a terrible person. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> that should be a bumper sticker. Your mom still hates you. Just your face pointing like that uh, Biden thing they got on the gas pumps now. But your face pointing and saying that that would be amazing. But hey, it's great <laughs> when they can come together and just be a family like that, and then they'll all go out front and play CeeLo and. You know, have some drinks at the bar or go have dinner, you know. Dinner. It's Crazy. Dinner is always a fiasco. It is. We, we've I'll learned some tricks. Yeah. You, you've helped us learn some tricks. Not <laughs> like, uh, don't, yeah, don't sit at the table for 40. It, it, yeah. you'll, you'll, you'll be hanging out with them anyways. When there's tattoo artists inside of the Foco de Chao or the Texas to Brazil, we're going to own that motherfucker anyways. So right. we'll be yelling across the room and throwing biscuits to each other. Don't worry. You can sit with just four or five of you and get quicker service, get to eat. However, yeah. I think the yeah. last time I was at the Texas to Brazil, uh, I was in Pittsburgh and, and uh, we ended up still at a table for, I think, 32 or something. Well, I just did it in Philadelphia at the Foco uh, with um, Craig and Helios. Love me some Helios. Right. Make sure you check out the Helios products at Helios Tattoo Supply. Check them out online and order now. Anyway, yes, Helios yes. is uh, doing a uh, party, a little pre-party for the Philly show Thursday night for all the Helios sponsored artists and such. And uh, it was about 35, 40 of us, but we had our own room. And they had right, okay. to come in to service us. And, so and the Foco de Chao or the Texas to Brazil, definitely better for large groups because they're, you don't have to wait for everybody's food to get prepared individually. And then they all bring it out. Some of it cold, some of it hot because it's been waiting. They just got guys walking around with meats on sticks. Do you think those guys are, I, I myself, I know, m me and Stelios talk about this all the time. Uh, we have a whole skit in our heads of the poor little um, guy walking around with the chicken on the, on the skewer and no one wants the chicken and everybody backstage ribbing them like, Oh yeah, they love my prime meat, my prime roast. What you, Oh, you got the chicken. Yeah. Yeah. No one wants your chicken, man. Get the fuck out of here with that shit. All these Absolutely. bitches out here want my meat. Steve Teft and I were crushing the bacon wrapped chicken. It was good. He sat yeah. next to me during the dinner. It was actually good. We were, we were making the guy come back. Yo, come here. He wasn't totally well. <laughs> It was right on, good. right on. You know, then I wanted to imagine that 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 kid was going back like they love my bacon wrapped chicken. Oh, ha, ha, ha. Yeah, 
<laughs> I found my table. This is my meaning in life. Fuck it. I quit this place. I'm traveling with the two with the tattoo tour. Yeah, and that's another thing with traveling with us. We we eat together. I mean, we're we're really a family. We eat together, we sleep yeah. together, we work together. You know, we're like I think a family that owns a local business, kind of. The family feeling of it is is why I have um I still feel comfortable having so many crazy ideas. Like my uh my political philosophies aren't the same as most people's, and they're also thankfully not the same as most of my friends, but we're all a family, and despite us having very diametric viewpoints on social in ideas sometimes. Like one of the biggest differences, like at the tattoo convention, you're, you're in front of the person, you're seeing them, you're talking, you're hugging, you know, but you're not talking politics and religion. And on social media, that people just want to talk politics and religion. And that's where most of that trouble starts in social media. <laughs> right. We really don't worry about that bullshit at tattoo conventions because we're too busy making money and having fun, you know? Well, more of that but you media. know me i'm a i am talking so, uh, politics and and so i think that's an amazing part too is it despite my many differences in uh, opinions with um friends of mine politically even though we're talking about it like man me and steve teff we'll go back and forth for a long time you know he's quite sure i'm an idiot and I, oh, great I, I, you. Or Greg Piper. I mean, Greg was going to, I don't know if you remember this, on, on social media, Greg, who is like nine foot tall and, and 250 <laughs> to 300 pounds, he was ready to take me out. He was like, I'm done with you. Fuck you. And uh, and then we actually, this is how, yeah, you remember, because we were doing the show. We were at the convention, at his I was convention. standing there with you. <laughs> well, you saw us talking and you walked over kind of like, oh, uh, shit. Uh, here's two of my friends uh, getting ready to throw down. Oh, shit. <laughs> yes. Which was not happening, though. We, no. were, uh, we were actually just talking about how we appreciate um, <laughs> somebody to hold us up and challenge us like that. Because we, f we both feel that uh, without our ideas being challenged, then they're not really as valid. And again, there is a difference between talking about it on social media and talking about it face to face. Oh, yeah. Jeez. Because, yeah, it was it was the social media that I think he was like prepared to drop me. And and quite honestly, I, I can take a punch, but I've never been punched by anything as big as my head, like a fist as big as my head. I don't know how I'd take Greg's punch. I, I, I'd hope that he would be really slow and I could run away. It's um to me, that's an amazing part about it. And, and it all. I think it, it, if you're going to do a convention, try to go there with the right mindset. Now, I think people are starting to get it more in tattooing now. There used to be a lot of competition back in the day. And so we always kind of hated each other, you know, because everybody was like competing to tattoo your, you wanted to tattoo the skin, you know? And well, that, and there weren't nearly as many fish in that pond that we're all fishing out of, you know? There right. are a lot of fishing poles in that pond and only so many fish that we could catch. Yes. And now Thanks. that pond has been restocked because of shows like Ink Master, you know, Black Ink Crew, and LA Ink, Miami Ink. You know, right. they, they just stock our ponds. The TV, much like the um, the whole idea of tattooing and what tattoos represent, it changed it. All right. You know, what? And, and in no small part, also, I would like to think, uh, or I would like to think, I think I would like to think that the tattoo circuits also have done that as um, or the tattoo festivals have also yeah. done that as one thing I know. And I hope to have uh, Troy on eventually uh, the owner of villain arts. And he's kind of pointed out to me, says, Kyle, he, he, he wasn't bragging. It's going to probably sound like he was bragging because he, because I'm going to preface brag. everything. He does not he brag. Bad. But he did explain, he says, Kyle, uh, Philadelphia is one of the longest running shows yeah. in America. It is also one of the biggest shows. That's not necessarily because Philly just was an anomaly and a place that would that would the tattoos would be popular. But all those things actually go hand in hand. He says, think about it. I spend more money every year for the Philly show, which is the biggest show in the world. I spend more advertising dollars for Philly. As I spend these, this huge amount in comparison to other cities, that has to have an effect on the people inside of that city, inside of Philly. 
their mindset then changes to a more acceptable one for tattoos. And when you go around Philadelphia, you definitely see that. You see that yeah. these people don't, they're not scared to hire a waiter with tattoos. They're not scared to hire um, a, a concierge with tattoos. You know, somebody that's yeah. the face of their business, they're not scared to. And much of that would probably be related to the psychological uh, effect of marketing his tattoo convention. His convention comes the year every town uh, the uh, the city gave him an award because he generates right. over two million dollars or over a million million or two million dollars every year oh in tax God. revenue just because of that show. I mean, it's it's a thousand artists and vendor booths, so you got right. easily two to three thousand people that are just working that show all right. in Philadelphia. And if you talk about the health department radius. fees alone. Oh yeah, and go to Walmart. Try to buy paper towels or distilled water or some <laughs> toiletries or you know some shit like that. I mean, and then the it's hotels not there. Are sold out. The restaurants you can't get reservations. Um, you know the local all mm-hmm. the local eateries and pubs are always full. It's it's a lot of people. I mean, that show well, draws thirty five thousand people for the weekend. In addition to the you know let's just say three thousand people working the show. That's that's a big generated that's a big money maker you know you're generating a lot of uh, people and income and and it goes off without English no fights no problems no gang stuff just fun tattoo that's it and he goes back I mean like you said his budget on advertising it fucking I can't say exactly what it is but I know over five hundred thousand dollars for just Philadelphia just oh my god see I was gonna guess at over 250 but no, that, it, 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 it definitely makes that. sense. I mean, you feel it when you come in. Also, that's what you feel when you go into almost any villain art show. We drive to the mall because we're not big fans of flying. And as we drive in, you start knowing that it's time to go buy paper towel because you'll see a sign that says the villain yeah. arts tattoo show because he so advertises that, in a radius you know, if a on the highways. Mile 50 miles and, from the point. And some cities even longer. Some cities go out further than 50 mile radius, you know, right. depending on where we're at. And that's billboards. That's, you know, signs in local stores, posters, flyers, bar coasters, radio interviews, bus stops, buses, you know, public transportation. Personal business owners. That's the part, the street team, where they become really important, the, doing the very personal work, like you've explained of going and meeting the owners and then talking nicely to them and getting the owners to then accept because the owner might not show up, but as long as they accept it and they talk about it, it it gives an opinion to so many more people, you know, because they see their patrons every day. That's another thing with Villain Arts. I mean, like we've been talking, it's it's a big family. We all hang together and eat and drink and, and, you know, sleep together, not with each other, but, you know, know, sometimes we're a family. Sometimes it happens. (laughs) Some you of know, those freaks out there. But uh, when you go into a city and all the local shops are already supporting you and what you do, because it's you pretty much set the standard on what a tattoo expo convention festival should be like, how it should be ran, set up, everything from the contest to the way you bring people in the front door and stamp them. You know, yeah. it, it's, it sets a standard. And you've got your local shops knowing that you're bringing something good. Because Troy, before being the super mega promoter that he is, he was a tattoo artist and he still yes. is a tattoo artist. So he wants to do what's best for him, his industry and his fellow artists. And he tries to do that at every show. So they're supporting him. They're telling all their local clients, they're posting about it. So there's, you know, some of that extra advertising that some shows don't get because nobody knows who the hell they are. Right. Right. They, they get um, in some of the best advertising, because of course it's word of mouth. Once right. done right. And, and actually, one of the lessons that we learned was, is Carl going to be there? <laughs> <That's>, <laughs> somebody will be like, hey, Kyle, man, I really want you to come out. Well, it's sounding all fantastic. Is Carl going to be there? <laughs> because right. what we've learned when, when you're not involved, although you are the voice of Tattooing World, that you're so much more. <laughs> you, you are a, a crossroads, a hub. Like You're like the uh, Atlanta... Uh, the uh, airport or something almost, you know what I mean? Like right. everything goes through you or, or is, is corrected by you. Um, so it, it, if I have a 
promoter reach out to me and say, Hey, I want to have you out of the show. That's one of the first questions Candy and I have learned to ask is, is Carl going to be there? Because at other shows, we have found ourselves in situations where you're like, what the fuck is going on here? You, you've actually got a, a breadth of stories, obviously, from your years of doing this. But I um, am always impressed because it kind of it showcases the effect that the MC can have on the show. When Hillary Clinton or Barack Obama <laughs> or McCain, I can't remember who it was, but it we was, were at uh, a show. Hillary and Obama. Okay. And they were going against each other in the primaries then. Yeah, yeah, in Philadelphia, actually. When we were not at the convention center, we were all still at the hotel. So okay, we had yes. In the hotel, and we would stay at the hotel, too. And, and, and so wasn't Secret Service or Hillary or, or Brock, but one of them was staying at the hotel as well, right? Both of if them. If not both. Both, yeah, okay. Both yeah, and... Uh, now, the unfortunate thing that happens is, is, I don't know, it's unfortunate. We smoke, there is a lot of weed being smoked generally at these conventions yeah uh, usually not indoors you know especially now we're in the convention centers nobody smokes weed indoors um right but at the hotel and at that time marijuana was not like it is now it was illegal dude you caught yes. weed in philadelphia you're going to jail and even if it's just you know an eighth or a quarter of marijuana you're going to jail um yes but they kind of like we turn a blind eye to our tattoo conventions you know because even back well, then, Troy, we packed that hotel beyond capacity. Well, you did something, though. They came to you and asked uh, if, yeah. if you could stop it or something. Like, they were, like, saying, hey, you got to stop this weed being smoking. We can't have Barack get a, get a contact. Right. It was, um, and they had, uh, they had extra secret service and extra police in the hotel because they were both staying there at the time. Yeah, they were like, wait and a second. Hillary's husband smoked but didn't <laughs> inhale. He she don't can't inhale. even get. He don't inhale. Yeah. I'm sorry. No, no, it was all good, dude. He, uh, the hotel manager, um, along with somebody, I guess, I don't know who the other person was. He may have been Secret Service, FBI. It could have been just a cop in plain clothes. But yeah. they came to me with Troy and he said, look, got to tell people not to smoke pot in a hotel. You can't tell right. them that Brock and Hillary are here. Don't say anything about the police, but they're going to want to get busted. They can't smoke weed in the hotel. Um, this just can't happen. So I grab the microphone, I walk and walk out, make the announcement. This I'm can't like, be easy though, because first off, right. you, anybody going, tells tattoo artists they can't is generally going to find out that they're wrong. Right. It's <laughs> like trying to tell a three year old they can't have ice cream. Right. Right. In an ice cream store or something. Right. So, the, um, the self serve ice cream store. Anyways, right, and I, I had just finished smoking myself, so <laughs> I, I I walk out, grab the mic, and um just off the top of my head i'm like hey guys you might notice all the extra police and security in the hotel that's because of our increased attendance this year you know so taking it off the hillary obama thing right and because of that we want to respect them and remind you that you cannot smoke marijuana in the hotel you gotta hear rumblings going on in the room ooh, and ooh. i instantly what i instantly was like but if you do do it in the bathroom put a towel by the door and turn the steam on when you're done <laughs> but again don't smoke marijuana in a hotel but if you do put a towel by the door and do it in the bathroom they won't smell it and right. with the steam uh, on I said, one or, I said one or two other things and then put the mic down and walked off and Troy's standing there like oh fuck dude what the hell you know right. he's not saying anything at this point but I could see it in his face like oh you just fucking sunk me with this hotel the yeah. manager and the guy standing with him was like, dude, that was amazing. That was the best thing we could have ever asked for. If, like, if he'd have told them not to do it, they wouldn't have listened. But now right. we don't have to smell it. <laughs> like, yeah, the important thing. became like famous. Everybody started doing that. They're like, Carl said we can smoke weed in the bathroom. <laughs> and that was great. They, is, went up uh, moving, um, they went up moving Hillary to another hotel because all the hotel employees were wearing Obama pins. And she couldn't take it. She could not. She had to move to a different hotel, and she uh, she had a whole half a floor, and he had the other half. Right. And then when she left, he had like a, an entire floor to himself. Right. Yeah. I don't. It's. it's um, I thought you were going to say Wu Tang Clan. Oh, why? What? I I do recall the Wu Tang Clan being that was the Ink Life tours. Yeah. But they just they were always smoking, right? Yeah, like no, you couldn't the, like the whole the hotel smelled like weed. 
I was in the back of the stage because I just brought him on stage and I'm always out with him, you know, fucking around on stage and shit. And uh, I was back there smoking up with somebody and uh, we were just smoking my chilling back there. And this guy's in the front row, they were right in the front of the crowd. And he's been giving, um, giving them the finger, like first couple songs. So finally he stops and he starts cussing the dude out from the microphone. And I'm like, oh, fuck, here we go. Because when the lead singer calls you out, what are you going to do yeah. in the crowd? The crowd's right. going to fuck them up. They're going to fuck so it up. Yeah. I'm like, I catch on. I'm like, oh, shit. And I said, no, the security's watching it fucking happen. The dude's in the yellow shirts. Um, Doing nothing. CS, I, I don't want to say it was uh, here in Baltimore. I used to do that. It's Contemporary Services Corporation here in Baltimore, CSC Security. The yellow shirts, you see them in Super Bowls. Those kind of okay. security guys. It wasn't them, but it was those type of security guys for the concert. We're sitting here just watching it happen. So you see me in all the videos because it's World Star and TMZ and everything else. And it, it pops up once a year on my timelines. People will always share it. I come out from backstage and I'm like, yo, get him the fuck out of here. Get him the fuck out of here. And finally, somebody clocks this dude. You see somebody else clock this dude. And um, I stopped it. Got him off the floor, bitched out the, um, I think it was Ghostface, and was okay. like, you're not here for that. We're here to fucking have some fun. And got the crowd back into it and got the show back going on. So I went back to the corner of the stage. Cop came over to me. He was like, dude, I've never seen anybody stop what could have been a riot with just words. <laughs> I'm like, yeah, they kind of listen to me around here. <laughs> but I'm they the dude do. on the stage all night, you know? <laughs> and part of my job is, is like you say, being that social butterfly, I'm the face of the show, yeah. So, you know, with the voice of the show, and it's um, got to become a burden at some point too, to where you're like, man, yeah. and even even being out, you have to worry about your own actions, and especially now with everybody wanting to um, being so quick to, it's like instead of hearing a joke and then is that funny or not, we hear a joke and instead of saying is that funny or not, we put it through our is that acceptable for me to laugh at or not? Right. You know, we put it through our imaginations of, of like, twi- well, what so, would Twitter say? Well, some of the shows, like um, the Villain Arts, we always try to, um, again, be in with the artists. You know, it's not you're coming to our show and you're, you're doing shit and giving us, you know, whatever. We're, we're working in this together. We're a co-op. You know, we're yeah. trying to help you get tattoos and get new clients. And you're trying to get clients and bring people over to our shows. So we want to go out and, and eat and drink together. And some nights, you know, I'll go out. Some nights, Troy will go out, you know. and there's You guys trying to take divide, different divide, turns? Yeah, divide and conquer on that. Um, <laughs> you know, and a lot of people at shows think I'm Troy. There are still people that years have been at shows will look at me and be like, hey, Troy. You know, while Troy's standing right there. It's right. funny. It's not I, as bad as it used to be. But I still get um, people asking. Uh, they'll, they'll say the, the they'll mention the guy with the red beard. He's he's the guy that runs the show. Because we'll be talking about Troy, but we, you know we're talking amongst ourselves. We're not we're saying he or you know we're not right. we're using our pronouns, and um, and, and they'll just imagine it's you because you're such the face of it. You're the organization. You you see the organization oftentimes. Yeah. If anybody says, hey, here's this problem, what should we do? They refer the problem to the, to the guy with the red beard. Well, the one show I missed for um, quarantining, I, I, you know, just out of abundance of caution for the artists and the people, I, I had to quarantine that weekend, uh, Cincinnati, I believe it was. And Chris, uh, Captain, Captain Mabel show took over. But um, Troy, the next week was like, dude, I never realized how many fucking questions you actually answered you know, and fires you put out, you know? Oh yeah. Yeah. Because now Chris is, instead of answering those questions, Chris is probably turning them over to Troy. Or, or they're going straight to Troy or people up front or whatever, you know? And a lot of times you come to me with something, I'm like, go see Frank or go see Neil, you know, because at that point I'm doing something else, you know, take care. Neil's got what you need. Frank will take care of your shit for your booth, you know? Right. So they're the two go-tos at the shows a lot of times. Oh, I think I hear my dog whining. You okay, Willis? Um, I, I don't know. Uh, I, honestly, I'm. This could be it. Like this has been really exciting. I don't. And, and it, we've done this before. I was really bad. <laughs> Remember the last time we talked and we tried to re- put this thing together? Yeah, yeah, I was, yeah. Candy was trying to edit it to see if there's anything salvageable from it because I was in such a bad uh, spot. 
So I think I'm going to try and wrap this up here by talking about the thing that started me off and put me in that bad spot because I should have before uh, when I talked to you, we talked about my um, removal from the ta- from the Ink Master show. And yes. you were only the, you are you know me as well as you, as anybody in the world. And then you saw me the day I got removed from the show. And Dude, you were telling balls for it, but you, you ruined my my shine in the spotlight. How did I do that? By by pushing Chris Nunez. Oh, and not being there. Yeah. You know, well, um, I was coming in as a, like um, a thank you because I had done casting for helping to find artists and casting mm-hmm. for canvases and some of the flash challenge shit. So they were bringing me in as like a, a celebrity canvas kind of thing. It was going to be a surprise for everybody. It was the first one out the door. And uh, you had Rob Zombie was the judge. Um, yeah. You had pushed Chris Nunez. So that was overshadowing everything because my episode was the episode after that. Did I overshadow? So, I would be excited yeah. then, actually, if I, I think I, I might have been a guest canvas to just being a canvas. <laughs> well, I'm sorry for that, but I feel good no, about okay. fucking up Rob Zombie's. Well, no, it actually, <laughs> it actually worked out because, um, you know, I well, it didn't work out for Halo because. You know, there's a bunch of shit. Everybody was already hollering about them, you know, cheating with um, Scott Marshall. Okay. And uh, they knew Halo and I were boys. And here I am. Halo's tattooing me. You know, they're, right. they couldn't let Halo win that one. But yeah, uh, it would have been worse before, if it was me because I knew you were coming on and I had already been drawing my, my tattoo for you for weeks. I had wanted so, you to tattoo me because yeah. that was would be the thing I said, even though Halo and Scott were picking you know who they who the who they get or whatever for that challenge i was like i want kyle dunbar you know to tattoo me <laughs> but um uh i saw you the night before it's uh right that, that night that it happened man um when you pushed yeah, them, really- forward to hang out with you and, and they had me in a hotel at the howard johnson separate, right yeah at a yeah. separate one than everybody else and then they which i want to laugh at for a second because they put everybody else up in the double tree yeah. um the Richie place that gives you the chocolate cookies when you go in. It's a really right. nice. Hotel. And then as I'm leaving, as I, as I push Nunez or whatever, and the, it's, it was almost like a demotion in hotels too. They well, put they, me at the Howard Johnson, but then yeah, I, they, then my they friend, told me was, they told me it was to keep me separate because they didn't want them to know I was coming in. I was the surprise. Okay. And, and then, you know, damn it, Kyle, <laughs> I was like, you know what? I, I honestly, there's there's a lot going on in my head. And one of the things that uh, occurred to me from the whole time that I was on there. Now, I've known Halo for 15, yeah, 15 years. I've always thought of him as a very remarkable artist. And I always put him in a higher than myself, his ability. So he came on the show, honestly, a lot because I asked him to. Or I told him, you know, no, it'd be cool to have you on there. I knew there would be a day that Halo and I would have to be going head to head almost, you know, and it kind of felt like it could have been that day, you know, like it was leading up to that as well. And I was, to be honest, I had a fear of that as well, if that makes sense. You know, I was, I didn't want to find out that I was where I thought I was or where I am not as good as Halo at certain tattoos, you know? So that was something that wasn't exciting for me. And I was also scared that there was a chance that I wouldn't tattoo my friend. How was I going to feel about that? Um, and then back on the show, there was, you know, well, Nunez was being a dick to me. Yeah, mm-hmm. I talked to Candy through all of this. I mean, while she wasn't, you know, of course, she can't tell you everything that's going on because she's not trying to fuck with you while you're on TV trying to win a right. fucking competition. She held up very strong. I mean, it was hard. You know, so yeah, I know people... that just a little bit you knew and the way they were fucking with you there, you know, it was rough. But God yeah. damn, you were, when I saw you that night, that was not the Kyle Dunbar that I knew. It was well, a explain totally that to Kyle. me, because that's what I shied away from the last time we talked too. It, it's very uncomfortable for me sometimes to listen to me not being who I think I am, but I'm often not, not who I think I am. So it's probably good for me to get it. What yeah, was a uh, shell shock, man? It was like total shell shock or um, like the person you see that's just, like they'd been in a major war battle and seeing their friends get blown apart and you know you get that far off spacey look or you know they're kind of looking out 
to the left when they're talking to you, looking up. I feel like I couldn't talk to you. Yeah. I felt like, like I couldn't put words together. You know, if, if you watch me, um, I, when I'm fighting with Nunez, he asks me at one point, he says, are you doing as good as sausage? Are you doing as good as Maddie? I think that's what he said. Maybe he said <laughs> Scott. But immediately my head thinks, like, so you're saying I'm in third place? But I, I can't, like, the, the synapses the, weren't firing enough for me to say it. Like, it's in my brain. It's a great right. witty comment. But at the same time, I when I go, when I study it, now I understand my amygdala was being engaged and I literally could not think of anything else except for my desire to punch him. <laughs> you well, know, dude, I remember going into the like whole damage control mode, like, you know, God, we you gotta get back on there. We can fix this. You can be like, blah, 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 blah. Do this. And you're like, I'm going to kill him. I'm going to rip his head off. <laughs> there is no fix in this car. <laughs> yeah. They asked me in the car, um, in the, in the van, Andrea, actually, who's the head producer very high up she used to work on uh on survivor as well and um well respected she's she's doing her job right i'm guessing to be where she's at but she got in the van with me when i was after all that had gone on and i'm expecting to go back and pack up my things and go home and she asked me do you want to stay and i think that's her exact words and i was just so again i i still could barely react to that i didn't know how 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 would that work I've watched the challenge my whole life. I've watched. And if anybody punches anybody, pushes anybody, like they don't get back on the challenge. They're gone that day. I was like, how would it work? And then she says, well, you know, I'd have to clear it with corporate, but I think there's some things I could do. Now, at that moment, too, I began thinking, what the fuck? Like, if you can do this to get me back on the show, if you have that much control, number one, why would you do it? You already got your exciting moment, right? So number one, when I'm thinking, why would you do it? I begin thinking, they have a plan for you, Kyle. This is, you really fucked up. You were probably supposed to be on stage. And that's why, because she's watching the design, everything that she put together and she's hoping her plan comes together, you know, for an interesting finale. That may have been there along the whole time. They may have been giving you a hard time so they could help showcase your your long bout with the competition or whatnot and then they would showcase that on the stage now when i also realize that though i also get a little bit angered because two things one you could have fucking told a kid you know <laughs> so, right. like, like you tell me i'm i'm destined for the finale and guess what i'm not doing i'm not going to beat up your little judge promise you uh but also at that point then you begin wondering about everything all the way down the line how much control did she have over wins of people how much control did she have over um handing out skull picks and things you know how much leverage did she have throughout all these times when you've either been the detriment of or the benefit of and at that moment i was like no there's no way that you can convince me that after seeing the bias against me I pushed this little guy and he is going to stop having this bias against me. Like there's no way that happens. Like he's going to be just as pissed tomorrow, if not worse. And then I give him the chance to humiliate me as he appeared. That's what really made me mad. I felt as though he was trying to humiliate me because at that time I was a traveling artist as well. Um, Was it Freddie Corbin was on or whatever? Um, was it Frank Corbin? It, uh, an artist I probably should know, but he didn't because he's from San Francisco, I guess. But he right. was on, and Nunez said something that actually Corbin was like, whoa, hold up. I wouldn't say that because they didn't like my tattoo. And Nunez was like, if you did a guest spot at my shop and you did this tattoo, I wouldn't let you finish the day. And then Corbin was like, whoa, I wouldn't, I wouldn't go that far. Like he felt like that was a step. Of, and I myself, I felt like, dude this is my livelihood like what, i think you wanted to be simon cowell you know the, yeah i think he yeah he was the simon cowell of the show or, or well, i want to be no i think he was Ollie, right oh he was like the tattooer man he was the old school tattooer guy that just you know got it he was there you for know? comedy relief sometimes he was his crazy. job was to say that tongue's driving me nuts i felt like he gave it the um the authenticity it needed 
you know, he was the guy to give it the authenticity. Um, Dave Navarro, well, notoriety. He's rock right. music. Soccer moms. You know, MTV crowds what they're wanting to pull in. And, you know, Dave Navarro's the dude, Jane's addiction and shit. He's good. Um, and Dave, he got a he got a lot of hate. And then Chris Nunez. All about not being another, it. yeah. And Nunez had already been on another popular TV show, so there's more tattoo TV recognition. You know, that was right. the formula for that. Uh, everything and formed. he explained to me actually he, ca- um, he called me up in my living room and gave me like this half ass apology uh, where he never said he was sorry but he danced around it a lot <laughs> and he also right. somehow wanted me to know that he was he would have been ready to, to throw blows I think it hurt his ego quite a bit right. so I mean, um, you're going to come to the shows and hang out with some of the guys we hang out with you can't get punked like that <laughs> yeah well, he pushed me, you know, so I don't know how much he got punked. I think um, yeah, I wasn't wanting it to kind ever get that. Kind of easy to push back when you know you're going to have like 10 people, you know, just right. jump in and break it up, you know? Yeah. Kid, yeah, he was mad immediately. Was- I think I've stayed too long, said too much, because generally I have. And uh, what General oh, Jay God. gave that to me is like, Kyle, use this. He, was, he wasn't wrong. But we love you, man. I look forward to catching up. We'll see you again in a couple of days here in Chicago. And hey, uh, let's in the do words this again. Of our, in the words of our buddy, GWC, Steve, wham, bam, thank you, fam. <laughs> wham, bam, thank you, fam. GWC, dude, we didn't even talk about that. So we got to get back on at some point to talk about the greatest night of my fucking life. Wearing Ric Flair's 42-pound sequin purple nature boy. Whoa, Ric Flair. Man, that was the, that was the best night ever. Check out Dude, our I got Instagrams. My arms for it. my side twirling in a circle in my living room right now. <laughs> right now, <laughs> yeah, because you can. You couldn't do it in the GWC. You would tip over all those toys, all those exactly. collectibles, every inch of it. Dude, I wanted to strut, and I started strutting. And as soon as I did my first strut, I like almost took a picture off of the off of the, uh, the wall in his hallway. And I was when like, okay. put on uh, the Macho Man robe, he did the same thing. He knocked something off the shelf. They're like, whoa, dude. <laughs> and yeah. Stelios was stomping his feet on the steps. <laughs> yeah, oh, the house wasn't made for that one either. <laughs> no. Well, we got to catch up about the GWC. We'll keep All an right, official bro. like a referee and a whistle when we do. And, uh, <laughs> yes. All I right, love man. you, brother. Much love. We'll talk to you soon. All right, I love you, All bro. Right.